If you're watching this video, you've been a very naughty person. Art, 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 art 101 with Mr. Burger. Hey friends, welcome back to Art 101 with me, Mr. Berger. I'm a professional artist and master educator trying to bring you the best in art historical videos. As always, I appreciate likes, shares, and new subscribers. So today's video is a little bit different. I take the research side of what I'm doing really seriously, and I recently found a book that I've been looking for for quite some time. This is a book by Sheldon Rodman called Conversations with Artists. And it is a book that has lots and lots of, uh, 35 to be exact, interviews that he had with famous American artists. And one of them of note that I'm going to talk about today is the last interview that was done with Jackson Pollock. And something that I discovered is that the story is, a, is very accurate to what I've heard, but also a little bit different from the way I've heard it. Uh, so there are some, some accurate things and some inaccurate things based upon some, some information that I've heard in the past. So instead of trying to regurgitate the whole thing, here it is in its entirety. I ran into Jackson Pollock less than a week after returning to New York from Taliesin West. There had been a party for William de Kooning following the opening of his show at the Sidney Janis Gallery. The party was in a dive on 10th Street. By the time I arrived, de Kooning had moved on, but among the stragglers I found Larry Rivers, Franz Klein, and Pollock. Klein said, everybody's gone to the Cedar Bar, let's go. But Pollock wasn't going anyplace, at least not yet. He was dancing. He had a battered brown fedora clamped over one eye, and his face was swollen and badly scratched. I hadn't seen Pollock since a visit to his home in the Springs, Long Island, about four years back, save for a brief encounter at the opening at the Mattis show two years ago. On that occasion, I had heard him mutter, Technicolor, in his beard as he went out the door, leaving the thrill of rediscovery to Bernard Perlin and to me. I had heard rumors of the difficulties Pollock was having even four years ago, and they had been confirmed on my first visit to the Springs. He had been trying to freshen or diversify his style by reintroducing figures, or at least figurative patterns, in the maze of paint. It was about the time de Kooning's women was attracting a lot of attention, de Kooning himself having momentarily abandoned the non-objective for some pretty savage shifts directed at the feminine sex. Whether de Kooning diverged first, I do not know. It really doesn't matter, as Ad Reinhardt, the abstract expressionist wit, would say. Pollock's trouble was stemming from the fact that the critics, having caught up with his web-like style after ten years of protest, at least having gotten used to it, resented the change. At least Pollock was unique, they were saying in effect. But now he begins to look like a hundred other abstractionists who can't make up their minds whether the images are taboo or not. Instead of taking out this lag on the part of the critics in stride, Pollock is said to have brooded over it. Of course he had painted recognizable images before. I met him in the early 30s. He was a star pupil of American regionalist Thomas Hart Benton, and could paint a thunderhead building up over a hayrick or an ornery mule, with as realistic flair as the crotchety Missourian. Then there was a period just before the war, when Pollock had been on his own for the first time, but he had continued to paint from nature, only occasionally moving away from plant or animal forms to sneak in the complex annuations he was later to popularize through abstraction in some Bushman-like hunter or pre-Columbian totem. But the net result of his effort to reduce the figure four years ago is Pollock's present impasse, talked out of his effort to move forward, he had too much integrity to move backward, or coast. For the decade between 1942 and 1952, he had been spontaneously productive. The now familiar pattern of streaked and drip paint had become so sought after that he could have gone on producing and selling them indefinitely, but he refused to. For two years now, he hasn't painted a picture. 
catching my eye at the 10th Street party. Pollock disengaged himself from his partner and came up to me. I had already been warned that my eye of man, with its strictures on contemporary formalism, might make me a persona non grata at this affair. Of course the painters won't have read it, my informant said, but they'll have read what Rosenberg and Haas have said about you in Art News. Are you an art critic? Pollock said belligerently. Hell no, I said. I'm just an aging anthologist. He laughed and went back to his partner. We'll talk about it later. With David Smith, I walked over to the Cedar Bar. De Kooning was there and ordered drinks for us. He insisted on paying for them, but Smith wouldn't let him. Wait till you sell a painting, Bill. Smith hadn't been to the opening or heard that de Kooning's show was a complete sellout. He himself had a show of his sculpture recently at the Willard Gallery, the net result of which had been one piece stolen, and he was inviting, in his usual gruff, extremist but good-natured way, against the galleries, museums, and collectors alike. I had heard that he had priced the sculptures himself when Marion Willard was away, all of them high and some over $5,000, according to Miss Willard. David, I said, that was the only reason they hadn't been bought. According to me, he growled, that is what they were worth, just figuring my time at a standard welder's union hourly rate. He was going to remove his things from the gallery tomorrow, he added. No more galleries ever. I'll sell them myself or keep them. It doesn't matter which. De Kooning looked sympathetic and ordered another round of drinks, on the strength of that remark, but shook his head a little doubtfully. Half an hour later, I started walking back home alone along 10th Street. Just short of Astor's place, I ran into Pollock, also alone, weaving his way toward the Cedar Bar. I was weaving by that time myself. He stopped me and asked where I'd been. To California and back, I told him. What did you see that was worth seeing? He asked dubiously. On the last lap, the Pennsylvania barns, I replied. He grunted, better than the houses? Because it was the livestock that really mattered. He reached out suddenly and grabbed a runt of a tree that was growing out of the sidewalk, pitifully supported by wire and bits of wire attached to stakes around it. What's the use of going further than this, he muttered. This tree's gotten everything. Leave it alone and it'll grow, and grow and be beautiful. No need to leave New York at all. This tree's got everything. Beautiful. Beautiful and he drifted off into the moonlight fog of dawn, dropping a package of matches. I stooped over and picked it up. The words printed on it said, There are good jobs for everyone in the telephone business. About a month after this party, I called Pollock from Sag Harbor. Since he didn't answer letters, I had no way of knowing whether he could be induced to talk on the record. He agreed. But a little while later, I was out when his wife, Lee Krasner, called and left a message for me Jackson was not in the mood to see me anymore. In his present frame of mind, it wouldn't be good for him. Call in the morning, but even then the chances will be poor. I decided to drive out next morning without further phone calls. When I arrived, Mrs. Pollock greeted me as though the phone call had never taken place. Jackson was still in bed, but she'd get him up. Meanwhile, we had a second breakfast. Lee Krasner is an abstract painter herself. I admired a mosaic table on the back porch, and she told me it was her design. In the living room hung a very long panel by Pollock. A loosely composed but expressive head next to a dense tangle of black squiggles. Impressive, like all of Pollock's work, in a violent, compulsive way. The house was spacious inside, undistinguished from the exterior except for the back view of the lovely meadow which roll away to a distant pond. Finally, Pollock emerged, in nondescript blue slacks and a t-shirt, bearded and blurry-eyed like a bear. This smile, coming to my mind along with the memory of photos of Dotskoyevsky and Rasputin, make me ask him, after our initial greeting, whether he was of Russian ancestry. He said no, he was Irish and Scottish-Irish, via Wyoming on both sides. I'm Russian, his wife said. At least my parents were Russian Jews. But she looks strictly New England, like a character in Hawthorne or Edith Wharton. She told me that they had come to the Springs originally for a brief visit in 1943, when Hayter and the Surrealists were summering here, and that when they had returned to their flat in the village, 
She had suggested renting or buying a house in the Springs. At first, Jackson reacted against it violently. All his reactions are violent, but later the idea struck him as a good one. So he moved out that winter and bought the house and have been here ever since. She had already told me that she and her husband were spending three days a week in New York with an analyst. For me, she had said, it's been extremely helpful, but Jackson is still resisting it violently. This didn't cause the break in his tremendous productivity, though, she added. That began two years ago. I was a little surprised when Pollock told me almost immediately of his forthcoming one-man show at the Museum of Modern Art. He seemed very pleased that they were doing it. The idea scares me a little, though, he said. He talks with difficulty, searching painfully, almost agonizingly, for the right word, with constant apologies for not being verbal. The sincerity of the man is overwhelmingly apparent. He is uncouth and inarticulate and arrogant and very sure of his place in art and of the importance of the movement with which he is associated. But there is not a trace of showmanship or phoniness in his makeup. He is friendly and warm-hearted, although he resists showing it, and no doubt would like to be thought ruthless and without sentiment. In respect to his art, of course, he is. This may be the tragic conflict that both makes his painting what it is and accounts for his inability to carry it further. Having noticed Julian Levi's mailbox on one side of his house and Corrado Marcarelli is on the other, I asked him whether he saw much of these artists. Levi might be called a neo-romantic. Marcarelli is an abstract expressionist, a painter of suggestive swirling figures reminiscent of de Kooning. Marcarelli was a close friend, Pollock said. Shall we walk over and see him? We walked along the highway, a somewhat hazardous route, since he became involved in trying to tell me why none of the conventional labels fitted his own paintings, and as he did so, wandered off toward the center of the road, down which Sunday drivers were hitting 60, gisultating and paying no attention to them at all, except now and then to grab me by the elbow and say, look out! This road is dangerous. Marcarelli, who was building an addition onto his house, came to the door and provided us immediately with cans of beer. His beard is black, and perhaps because of it, is more luxuriant and curly than Pollock's brown one. Gives him a more benevolent appearance. I told him that they reminded me of the Smith brothers, and that I'd like to photograph them together on the sofa, which was just big enough for the two. I asked Pollock, meanwhile, to elaborate on this business of labels. I don't care for abstract expressionism, he said, and it's certainly not non-objective and not non-representational either. I am very representational sometime and a little all of the time, but when you're painting out of your unconscious, figures are bound to emerge. We're all of us influenced by Freud, I guess. I've been a Jungian for a long time. When you start a picture, I asked him, do you have any preconceived visual image in mind, or is the result wholly spontaneous, something that happens in the process of painting? When Pollock prepares to answer, he squints, squishes up his face, tilts it to one side. How do I know? I have and I haven't. Something in me knows where I'm going. And, well, painting is a state of being. You mean being and becoming are one? Exactly, I guess. I don't blame you for guessing, I laughed. I'm not sure what I mean myself. No, this is what I'm trying to get at. Painting is self-discovery. Every good artist paints what he is. I'm painting figures, human relations, if you like. Marcarelli said, in most of my pictures, but you're not communicating anything about specific people, are you? I said, or the relation to the world. Not in the sense Sean and Levine are, he said, if that's what you mean. But I hope I'm communicating my emotions and my feelings about the world, both of which involve people. Whereas they are illustrations. Sean is a great illustrator. At least he was in such work as the Sacco Venetti series, which I admire very much. But it isn't painting. Painting, even in times when the artist was preoccupied with reproducing aspects of the visual world accurately, was something else again. 
Take Ucello's battle pieces. What makes them great is not what Ucello has to say about any specific battle or persons involved in them, but the excitement of what goes on in the picture in terms of images and the juxtaposition and paint. With the realists of today, nothing happens beyond the story they are telling. The surface isn't alive. It's not today. Then you think it's impossible, I asked him, to achieve this kind of visual excitement in our time by manipulating the objective data and the people we know with any kind of a recognizable form? It's a different age we live in. It's an age of indeterminacy, perhaps. Morals are indeterminate compared with other times. You don't call a thing or a person good or bad the way you could once. We know there's good and bad in everyone. This intermittency comes out in our paintings. Perhaps that's why we're not interested in making portraits. That would be too precise a statement to lend itself to a painting as we practiced it. Pollock nodded his head and seemed to go along with this. He added that when you try to emulate the old masters, as Benton, Grant Wood, and Curry had, the more recently painters like Levin and Tooker, yes, and Larry Rivers, you get corn, real corn, bits of renaissance, pastiche are still bits of renaissance pastiche, no matter how blurry you make them. I told him of my debate with Jules Langsner of Art News at UCLA, and of how his statement that you couldn't paint like Rembrandt in an age of fragmented forms and atomic destruction had made me ask whether Rembrandt's themes, birth, love, humanity, compassion, old age, death, etc. were any less concerns of life today. I asked Marcarelli whether, for example, if he was moved by the compassion expressed in the Rembrandt's prodigal son. We may feel compassion in it, he said, but did Rembrandt's contemporaries? Probably they didn't go for it at all. We don't know what Rembrandt felt, and we don't know what emotions people in the future will read into our paintings either. They asked me whom I had interviewed recently, and when I mentioned Wright and Philip Johnson, Pollock remarked that both architects hated paintings. What's Johnson got in that glass house of his? One painting? A poosin? If it's a poosin. And as for Wright, he's a great architect, I guess, but what an expletive. That museum. We've had all this trouble in doing away with the frame, and now this. Paintings don't need all this fooling around. The hell with museums. Put the paintings in a room and look at them. Isn't that enough? You remember that old building where the Museum of Modern Art started? What was wrong with that? I was in a house designed by Mize once. I felt so taunt I couldn't say anything. We were all supposed to meet at the beach but couldn't find each other. I drove back to Springs late in the afternoon to say goodbye. This time accompanied by my wife, Maya, who had been at the beach in the morning with the children. The Pollocks insisted that we stay for a drink. Do you know Catherine K? Pollock asked me. I said I did, and that I'd seen her in Chicago a month ago, when she was assembling the Benil show for Venice, entitled American Artists Paint the City, in which he and Marcarelli had been included. What a ridiculous idea, he said. Expressing the city never did it in my life. I don't think it's so ridiculous, I said. Aren't you all doing it, consciously or unconsciously? I feel it in your painting and inclines and Bill de Kooning's, not to mention artists like Toby and Hedda Cern and O'Keefe, who admittedly are doing it. What are you expressing if you are not expressing the turbulence of the city life or your reaction to it? He thought hard, grimacing with the effort. Nothing so specific. My times and my relation to them, no. Maybe not even that. The important thing is that Cliff Still, you know his work, and Rothko, and I, we've changed the nature of painting. You leave out de Kooning? I don't mean that there aren't any other good painters. Bill is a good painter, but he's a French painter. I told him so the last time I saw him after his last show. You were there at that party, weren't you? French, I said. You know what French painting is. If you don't, you won't see what I mean. All those pictures in his last show start with the image. You can see it even though he's covered it up, or tried to. Why does he cover it up? Style. That's the French part of it. 
he has to cover it up with style. But why do I say this to you? You're against all this kind of painting, aren't you? I'm against making a cult or a dogma out of it. I'm against ruling out other ways of painting, as Hess does in Art News. That's what I was trying to say in The Eye of Man. I'm with you there. None of the art magazines are worth anything. Nobody takes them seriously. They're a bunch of snobs. Hess is scared, scared of being wrong. I hate to admit it, but I prefer the approach of time. I'd rather have one of my pictures reproduced in Collars or the Saturday Evening Post than any of them art magazines. At least you'd know where you stand. They don't pretend to like our work. But to come back to the French paintings, I said. Come out to the studio, he said, and maybe I can show you what I mean. Maya and I went out with him while the children drifted off into field picking daisies. The studio was padlocked and he searched frantically in his pockets no key. We waited while he went back into the house. After about five minutes he returned, shaking his head. Lee hasn't got one either. There just isn't any key. He smiled wirily. There's something for the analyst, he said. The painter locks himself out of his own studio and then has to break in like a thief. Before we could stop him, he smashed a pane of glass. Couldn't we force the window, I said? He tried, but without success. There were wedges nailed in from the inside. Damn! With his elbow he smashed another pane, and then another, tearing away the wooden strips between them. Wait, I'll get a hammer and really go to work on this. He ran back into the house while we collected the splintered glass into a pile. Returning with a hammer, he finally managed to raise the lower half of the window and shoving a table covered with dusty sketches out of the way stepped in. We followed him. The main studio was an extraordinary sight. The main studio was an extraordinary sight. Huge paintings, some of them 20 or more feet long, demonstrated clearly enough what he had meant. They weren't French or even American. They were simply Pollock. Painted lace, slashed or dripped on canvas after canvas, but always aggressively, authoritatively, as only he can do it. Undoubtedly the expression of a tormented but vital personality. Even the patterns of paint on the floor itself, where the lines and drips of pigment had spilled over from the edges of the recumbent canvases, were recognizably Pollock. I asked him how he got the effect of a powdery white line that crisscrossed one and black-brown canvas dizzyingly. Don't tell him, Maya said. It's a professional secret, and if you tell him, he'll start doing it. I couldn't tell him if I wanted to, Pollock said. I don't know. Probably he knew very well. At any rate, the stacks of drawings going back to the 30s indicated beyond contention that Pollock can draw sufficiently from nature, or in the realm of nature, derived fantasy, if he wants to. As we were going out, he lifted from the rubble a massive toy locomotive, three feet long, very cunningly made out of iron, but badly rusted. He had found it in a field nearby and wanted us to take it for the children. It was clear that he wanted children, and it was clear that he thought a good deal of the locomotive, and Maya declined on these grounds. I never give anything away unless I love it, he said. I'll send you something I feel that way about when I get back, I said. One of my daughter's paintings, for instance. I hate paintings, he said. As we walked toward the window to climb out, he took a look back into that layer of creative devastation. These paintings, the ones I've kept, are my securities. They're all I've got left. He leaned out of the window and looked at the view of the distant pond. Painting is my whole life. All right, now, I love that story. Don't say anything else, okay? Keep your mouth shut. Thank you.